Hi everyone, this is Al McKay. Welcome to episode 118. I'm speaking with Justin Gobi Fields. Let's dive in. Welcome to the Alan McKay Podcast. Alan is an Emmy Award-winning visual effects artist and mentor to many leading industry experts. Listen in as Alan talks with other industry leaders in film, video games, and visual effects about their experience, lessons, and methodology. Alan will teach you pivotal advice to fast-track your career, better your skills, and reach your ultimate dream job. Check out the latest episodes on alanmckay.com. Okay, so I hope you had an amazing Christmas if you celebrated that. Otherwise, I hope you still are having an amazing holiday at the moment. So welcome to episode 118. So just a heads up, I am sick as a dog right now. And um, that's my own doing from working way too hard on this new free training series that I've been putting together. So just a heads up, if you want to check this out, basically, I wanted to do something which I personally haven't seen done before, which was to shoot a live action real performance and go and create a character driven visual effects shot from that as a training series. So this is something that in the past I've not really seen anyone ever really attempt and I wanted to really kind of push it a lot further. So we do a lot of digital makeup having this guy's face decay and fall apart. This is actually the uh, head of 3D at Nike, which I thought was uh, pretty hilarious to go up to him at a bar and I was just like, hey, how do you feel about your face melting off? And he's just like, let's do it. So um, I went and shot that on the red Epic W with the helium sensor. So I'm getting extremely nasally here. And um, yeah, we went and match moves. I had one of the match movers from Weta uh, do the match move for it. And I created all the visual effects. And I wanted to also use Max 2018's new fluid solver, which is Nyad's or Bifrost's uh, fluid solver as well. So there's a lot of different stuff that we dive into. It's a lot of fun. And if you want to check that out, it's 10 hours it's spanned over seven videos you can check it out at alanmckay.com slash decay so d-e-c-a-y just in case i sound too inaudible to uh, understand and um yeah you can download that for free as well as the raw plates the proxy plates the match move data i also made it available in other file formats so that way if you wanted to do it in Maya or Houdini, Cinema 40, whatever you wanted to do it in, um, then you know, you've got the freedom to do that as well. So this is available until January 12th. So it's my gift to you. And I wanted everyone to go through it together. I've already been getting emails from people showing a lot of what they've been making. And it looks phenomenal. So I'm really excited about this and uh, really excited to just see what everyone can do with it. And at the same time, um, opening up the registration for the live action series right now as well. Uh, You better hear about that um, through the training series. Um, That is the main thing. Like I said, uh, I've been working crazy hours. I was averaging about two hours sleep uh, every night uh, for the past couple of weeks, just working on this, trying to get it all done. And naturally, as I've talked about many times, if you work yourself to death, you're going to get sick and it's just not worth it in the long run. Well, that's exactly what's happened. So I'm kind of out of action in the last couple of days. But um, that being said, the best year yet training as well. I'm going to leave that in the show notes. But um, if you want to get all the episodes, the videos, everything for that, I've fallen a little bit behind on that just because I've been trying to get a productivity guide done, a new hardware guide. Um, There's something new that we're going to be doing, which is basically twice per year, we're going to be putting out a hardware guide book. It's looking pretty lengthy, but it's going to go really in depth about everything that you need to know about computer hardware, specifically for visual effects. And um, that's going to be coming out soon. The Productive Artist book uh, is out as well. I'll leave a link to that in the show notes too. And um, the best year yet is the boot camp that we're doing. I'm thinking that we are going to continue doing the boot camps um, with a few alterations. I'm not sure whether it will be right as January hits, but um, I would like to try and keep up doing three episodes per week. But uh, like I said, the me being out of action for the last couple of weeks, sorry, a couple of days is um, definitely put me behind schedule a little bit, but we'll we'll see how things go. Um, But I've been getting a lot of really great feedback. And for anyone who I haven't responded to your email yet, uh, I'm hoping 
that this week, the week of Christmas, is going to be my week of email. So I'm going to be sitting down and trying to reply to as much email as I can. So um, yeah, I definitely will do my best to respond to everyone I can. I'm getting probably a couple hundred emails a day at the moment, which is just pretty insane. But um, that being said, this episode is going to be really cool. It's with Justin Fields or Justin Gobi Fields. And um, Justin's worked on everything from Iron Man 3 to uh, Wolverine, Black Sails, Noah, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, Goosebumps, Jupiter Ascending, lots of really cool projects. He has his studio, Ironclad Studios, and um, does a lot of really phenomenal work. So uh, I definitely recommend checking out his work. And this episode was a lot of fun just to kind of dive into a lot of his background, a lot of his best practices, and um, just everything else we get into. So that being said, I will leave it there and um, definitely check out the show notes. So simply go to almckay.com slash 118 for episode 118 and you'll be able to check out the show notes um, check out links to Justin Gobi Fields websites and his social media uh, as well as get access to the best year yet boot camp that we're running again all of this stuff is free um, the productive artist and on top of that it'll leave a link to the uh, new live action visual effects training course that I've put out for free. Um, but obviously that again, is just alamckay.com slash decay, D-E-C-A-Y, if you want to check it out as well. All right, so I will leave it there. Let's dive into this episode. Just uh, to start out, I mean, as I just mentioned before, I'd, I'd love to kind of chat a little bit about how you got started. I mean, did you always want to be an artist when you grew up or is it something you kind of fell into along the way? Um, I always, I always wanted to be an artist of some sort. Um, my mother was a artist. She used to do, um, a lot of watercolor and silk screening type paintings, uh, which was always really cool to see. Um, and then, you know, just growing up, you know, it was, I was just nuts over comic books and I really, really wanted to be a comic book artist for the longest time. Um, I remember my, uh, high school art teacher, just being fed up because (laughs) all I wanted to do was comic book and (laughs) sci-fi and he would, he would desperately, desperately try to get me to try other things. And when I was in high school, I was just obsessed. That's all I wanted to do. You're like, you know, he's like, have you seen Picasso? And it's like, have you seen McFarlane and all these other people? Yeah. 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 It's like, have you seen Jim Lee and Mark Silvestri? This is, uh, this is what I want to do. Yeah. Actually, I've interviewed uh, Bay rate who, um, he, was one of the original guys who created Golem at Weta, one of the, the first 30 employees at Weta. And um, oh, wow. yeah, he he got his big break working for McFarlane on uh, a few comics. And now what he's doing is actually trying to do virtual reality comics, which I thought was pretty awesome. Oh, um, neat. Yeah, so I'm, I'm kind of interested to see how that all works. But, you know, it sounds pretty cool. Um, yeah, so that's really cool. I mean, and for you, I guess, like, how did you kind of discover... 3d and you know kind of dive into all of that was just kind of like a a linear thing from because i did the same thing i came from being obsessed with comics i was one of the people in my school who was like you know just all we did is draw all day long and um and then you know just with the computer it was like shit i can't draw these shiny silicon graphics looking things how do they do that so um that was kind of my evolution (laughs) but for you like how did you kind of discover 3d and kind of start pursuing that as a career well, you know, like right out of high school, I was really I was really bummed because uh, where I was living in Illinois, there really wasn't much of an artist culture mm-hmm. or there there wasn't really any schools that were geared towards pursuing the arts. So uh, I kind of gave up for a while. I, you know, I just kind of worked dead end jobs and in different jobs in retail. And and uh, my most famous one was like was pizza delivery. Um, but then I went to uh, I went to doing graphic design and you know, did that for about a year and a half. And then the market completely dropped out again. So it was like, I was making more money, more reliable money delivering pizza than I was doing, you know, uh, websites or ads or anything like that. So then I, I, I literally gave up for about 10 years and I didn't, I didn't touch anything or do anything artistic. And then, um, you know, a couple of my friends started working in the game industry and the film industry. And I was like, Oh my gosh, you know, it's totally possible. You can totally do that. Right. And so, um, just to jump in for a second, so like, yeah. was that like a, a bit of a common thing that you're feeling that um, with 3D, you know, it's not something you'd actually make a career from. It's more of a hobby. Um, I never <clears throat> I never even like when I when I was taking my break on hiatus, 3D was not even in my ballpark. Right. Like I, I wasn't even thinking about doing that. Um, 
I didn't know what I wanted to do. Like it took it took a friend of mine sending me uh, a copy of the Skillful Huntsman and like a Noman DVD on how to draw robots, and I was just like, oh my gosh, you can make <laughs> a living at this. And uh, after that, I, I applied to the the Noman School of Visual Effects, and I was there for about a year. Mm-hmm. And I had to uh, I had to drop out, but luckily. I scored an internship to work under Jared Moran's and uh, you know, it's, it's been a whirlwind since then. That's cool. So um, how did you score the internship? Again, like I'm always thinking about people who they're trying to connect the dots of, you know, Hey, I I love drawing and I could never see a career in this because, you know, I, again, I just interviewed actually my fiance the other day, who's also a designer. And, you know, one of the big things we talked about was the fact that, her whole life growing up, she would always get her parents saying, get a real job. And so yeah. it was kind of brainwashed into her that art is not a career. And so for you, um, you know, how did you initially score the internship there? Um, you know, honestly, it was it was it was more about. So when I went to Noman, I was a lot older. Right. Um, I was a lot older than my fellow students. Um, this it felt like this was my last chance because I was in my you know 30s and trying to go back to school at that age, it felt really strange and weird to me, mm-hmm. but it's, I, but it's something that I was like, Oh my gosh, I have to try at least once. Um, and I think I approach school at a different way than I, th- I see a lot of younger students and it was really like the last shot for me. So I treated every single homework assignment like a portfolio opportunity. And I think that my instructors noticed. That's awesome. Yeah, I think it's so critical. I think that most people don't put that fire under their butt. And um, when you actually treat it like that, that like, look, you know, this is make or break. I, I'm going to take this seriously. I, I used to teach at a college, fuck, a long time ago, 20 years ago. And that was one of the things that came up a lot was you could identify who came straight out of high school and who actually paid for their own education, not their parents. And they went there on their own yeah. way because, you know, there's some people who are just expected to be force fed the information and don't take it seriously. Then there's others who are like, look, I'm paying a fortune. I'm a bit older and yeah, I, I want to make a career out of this. Like I have actual expectations of what I want from, from doing this. So that's cool. I think it's really important to have that, that pressure you put on yourself um, to actually get results. And, Cause that way you're starting to do everything uh, while paying attention to like what the results yield. So I think that's great. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it comes down to like, a couple different factors, you know, like there's, there's always people I'd say, I'd, I'd say more than half of people that go to school to get into this industry are in love with the idea of working in the games industry Mm -hmm. or in the film industry, but they don't really know what it takes to do it. So once they find out, they kind of just kind of, you know, fade off or they don't, um, you know, they, they don't stick around this, the, the film and games industry is definitely, uh, you know, it puts you through the ringer. Yeah. And those that survive are the ones that stay for life. It's definitely but, a, a natural selection. You know? <clears throat> yeah, it's not it's not easy. And I hate I hate doing that, you know, where it, it sounds like I'm I'm negative about the industry. Um, I mean, it has its ups and its downs for sure. And I'm sure you you've you've been through it all just as like, <laughs> you know, many, many others. Too yeah. many downs. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's it's just it's just a hard finish line to get to. And mm-hmm. not a lot of people can or are in the position to cross that finish line all the time so one of my one of my friends at infinity ward uh ben lou like when he told me like i knew him back when he was a junior and he told me that when he went to college uh his animation teacher was basically introduced everyone said hi and like look around you like pretty much everyone on your left and your right they're not going to make it so you know but it, <laughs> it, it is kind of the brutal truth because um I was, t- I was talking about this recently with a few friends because I was thinking, like, what occupation do you have where you meet up with your buddies and their partners and you've got to, like, tell each other, like, let's not talk about work because, you know, partners are here or whatever. And it's kind of yeah. like it's a whole other culture that, like, you it is your entire life and it, it d- definitely does consume you. And it's something you, don't, you can't really um, dabble in the same way you might try, like, you know, other occupations. This is something where it takes so long to get to a point that you can actually do anything um, that's worthwhile and by that stage you've either you know given up or you've made it you know by the time that you're actually at that level so i mean it's definitely a, a lifelong pursuit and yeah i mean i don't think anyone's ever really gonna master 3d you're gonna be able to continue growing in your niche area but yeah it's it's definitely um it's definitely different to all other careers for sure and yeah absolutely with um 
with your the first project you ever did, like what was that? Um, the first film project that I was on, I believe. Um, oh, it was a it, it was a Sony project, but I think it got canceled. But I'm not I'm not quite sure what the name it was. The second one that I was put on was uh, Jupiter Ascending. That's awesome. And it, okay, so that was a couple of years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. That's really cool. And I guess like uh, for you at the time, I mean, what were your first few projects like? Were they, you know, huge learning curve? Was it something you're really proud of? Or was it kind of, you know, more trial um, and error? It, you know, it was, I, I hate to say that it was easy, but the only reason it was easy was because I had, I was in a studio setting and I was working with, um, uh, concept designers like, you know, um, Jared Moran's, uh, Jared Kravetsky, I'm, I always butcher his last name. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, like Kelton Cram and a, and a few other guys that were just really good. Luke, Luca Numilato, you know, we were, we both got into the, the studio at the same time and, uh, we were both from Noman. We were literally taking the same classes. So we got, we got cool. offered, you know, internships at the same time. I think he was before me, but, um, no, it was being around those guys and learning from them was it was it was one of the hardest moments in my life because of the learning curve that I that I had in front of me. But um, it was also one of the best times because I, you know, it kind of felt like there was a little little bit of a studio family, you know, um, and then, you know, it, it's like things changed at work and it wasn't there anymore. And it, it was just like it, it felt like it was time to go. Right. And, uh, you know, uh, a few of the other artists that were there had left. And I kind of learned under them. So when they weren't around, I, I just wanted to follow them around. So essentially, I went freelance and uh, never looked back. That's cool. That's really awesome. And yeah, yeah like I was going to say, um, yeah, I, I do think that's also, I, I, don't, I didn't expect to kind of fixate on the, the student part. But like, I do think it's another interesting thing that, um, which is why networking and actually getting to collaborate and make friends early, even as early as being a student is so critical because... Uh, so many times we're working on projects and we hire someone from like a graduate from college. And as soon as they get there, they're instantly like, oh, there's three other people who are really amazing we have to get. And so usually that one person pulls in those others. And I think it's so critical yeah. to kind of build those groups very early on, because, again, one of you is probably going to make it and pull the rest of you into uh, their world as well. So, yeah, I think it's really important. Um, well, you, you know, it, you know, some people that I know always, you know, they, they joke about it whenever I say this, but the industry is really, really small. It doesn't matter what continent you're working on. Um, people, people listen, people pay attention, you know, uh, how you treat other people. So it's just like, you have to put your best foot forward at all times and make sure that you're doing what's right, you know, um, cause word gets around. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I mean, as you just mentioned before the call, like we've got plenty of mutual friends and yeah, I usually on Facebook, it's one of those things that, uh, you get a bunch of, uh, French friend requests. And for me now it's basically I'll scroll down. If I have like one or two slots open, um, still on Facebook, then it's like, all right, who is the most mutual friends and 200 people, 300 people. And you, <laughs> you'd think that would be weird, but it's in this industry, it's not. So, um, yeah, it's such a tiny industry and, um, yeah, that's just it. Like you, you know, everyone everywhere It's yeah, it's, it's huge in that respect. Um, and I, I guess for you, like, what was it like going from, you know, doing one of those first gigs to breaking the freelance? Was that kind of a scary time for you? Or? It was, it was very, very scary, but it, it reminded me I had, I'd gone through it once already, you know, doing the, you know, graphic design, uh, you know, business card menu website route. You know, I did that for, for a good three to four years before that market fell out. And then, but it was like, I still had to build up clients. You know what I mean? Like it wasn't, it was, it was like I was starting over. So I still understood what it, what it was going to take to, to do it. And I, I believe when I went freelance, you know, like I had already kind of built up a little bit of some contacts. So it didn't feel like that. It was that rough for me, but I, I remember going to school. I had to sell everything just to, just to stay out here one extra term um just to say one more term at Noman. i i think i sold everything i owned and i had my computers my dogs and my bed in my apartment and you're, that was you got your kid at the pawn shop you're like i'm gonna get you back one day <laughs> and then like yeah like like seriously like i sold uh like i remember when i first moved out here and i i was gonna try and keep like a game system but then i was like you know what i'm not here to play games i'm here to you know i'm here mm -hmm. to to learn and I spent as much time as I could on the Noman campus, and uh, it was absolutely great. 
That's cool. That's really awesome. And just uh, staying on that for one more moment, but like um, over the, the past 10 years before you went to Noman, like um, what were you doing during that time? Um, you know, I pizza delivery. This is the whole time? Okay, cool. Um, pretty much, of- pretty much on and off. You know what I mean? Uh, I was still doing random art jobs for like, you know, local bands. I do like CD packages and then I would make sure it was funny because like I was I was all about branding things. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. your website should should have the same feel as your business card and your flyers should all have the right size logo and stuff like that. So I would do that for um, local bands in Springfield, Illinois. And essentially from there, I mean, I had those those clients were kept telling me like like, you know, like the amount of work that you're doing is so uh, detail oriented that uh you should really pursue this in a different means. And I was just trying to tell him, like, you know, I, I didn't really, I, I wasn't having fun doing that. It was just, it just seemed common sense to me. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Um, no, I, I think it's, it's pretty cool. And like, do you think that a lot of the experiences you had along the way, like from those past 10 years, you were able to apply later on? Because I do think that, again, going back to people straight out of college, or I should say straight out of high school, um, I think that later in life, because this is a common thing that comes up, is am I too old to change careers? And like one of my friends, Matt Conway, he's a matte painter. He came from Norman. Um, I think he didn't really start till his 30s. He was doing a very different career. And uh, I, I think that like along the way, like just having that life experience, like makes you a, a more experienced worker later anyway. So even if you're not directly working in the same field, you're able to leverage a lot of the experiences that you got from other industries and just life in general, um, you know, dealing with people and managing, not making dumb mistakes and being excited and diving in without really planning first, all those sorts of things. So for you, I do think that um, having approached it later in life definitely helped you be um, a bit more uh, mature and, and experienced in other areas. I, I believe so. Um, you know, like I learned in the time that I was doing uh, professional graphic design, you know, there was, there was photo uh, touch up jobs and um, photo manipulation jobs where I was just like, you know, I, I understood the pipeline and I understood that it wasn't about fine art. You know what I mean? It was like, how do you get something looking a- as good as possible in the shortest amount of time to keep your client happy? And, you know, like when, when I jumped into the, the film and TV uh, design world, it was very much it was very much that where I didn't I didn't have a lot of. Uh, qualms or misconceptions on how the real world works in terms of art creation um and that you know i feel like i I just adapted because i was like oh this is this is how you do it okay then i'm just going to do it that way or uh, oh i'm going to look up more on this subject and and these artists and and try and see you know their workflows and figure out how their brain works and and stuff like that so for me you know it was just like you have to you have to understand your role in the assembly line, and you have to make sure that you, whatever you do makes it easier for the guy that that comes after you. No, I, I think it's really solid advice. Um, and yeah, I mean, looking at some of the projects you've done, like what what do you think are probably your top three favorite projects so far? My top three favorite projects, the, the ones that you don't hate with everything. the ones that, you, <laughs> that I don't hate. Um, you know, anytime I work on a film, it. it I really do enjoy a lot of it. Um, I had a great time working with um, uh, Section Studios on uh, on Max Steel. Uh, That was a fun. They they did a. It's an animated show that they turned into a live action. Yeah, Um, I worked on. I animated actually on Max Steel as a character. Oh, did you? Back. (laughs) Well, no, no. This is back in '99, I think. Mm, A long mm. time ago. But uh, yeah, good to see it's still making its way around. Yeah, yeah, that that was a really fun experience because I got to work with um, Justin Yoon and and Cecil Kim and and their amazing project designers or uh, project leads over there. Um, that was a really fun job. I'm trying to think. My I'd say my favorite film experience so far has been working. I worked on Goosebumps and did a lot of creature designs uh, alongside uh, some really great designers. Um, like Neville Page and and working right. with uh you know the director Rob Letterman one on one was really really good uh a, gr- a great experience. Cool, that's awesome. Yeah. Actually, yeah, I've I've only seen the trailer for Goosebumps, but right away I was like, I kind of almost want to watch it just for um you know it just looks like a fun you know kids movie, but still a fun movie. It's like oh yeah, it, it well it was in my opinion. I, I thought it was a lot of fun. Um, 
definitely not something that I would have gone and seen by myself in the theater, but taking my nieces and nephews. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> or, or you can use them as an excuse, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I did cool. do that a lot, actually. <laughs> so with that project, I mean, what, did, what contributions did you have to that? Um, you know, I did a lot of uh, ZBrush concept sculpting where um, I was given a brief and then I would design something. Um, like I, I designed the, uh, the Praying Mantis for the film. Uh, a few other ones, some of the alien robots. Um, it was it was really really fun, uh, and we were brought on like before it was even like greenlit. So it was like Neville and I in the office, and I think Carlos Wante was there. Um, and it was very very it was very interesting because everybody had different workflows and if everybody had different ideas. So the director would be like, "Oh, I want to see what werewolves look like." And then, you know, like everybody would kind of take a, a stab at doing werewolves or, or aliens or whatever, you know. Um that job was always funny to me because I remember getting called for it and you know, being walked into this 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 film office. Um and Neville was there and the it was funny cuz the director had pulled out this this pitch book of artwork and going through it like he hit this alien section and it was nothing but my artwork <laughs> and it's always guy, a good sign <laughs> yeah and he's just like yeah do you think that you can get close to this quality and i and i always i always <laughs> thought that was the funniest thing cuz i was like yeah cuz that's that's my artwork yeah <laughs> <laughs> and he goes oh well then perfect <laughs> <laughs> you're hired <laughs> you're hired yeah that's cool. Um, no, I, I love that. Like, I love those situations. It's kind of like, is this rigged or, or what's going on? Um, yeah. <laughs> so, and, and again, like coming in from like the start of a project, because I, I think, again, it's, um, I, I always love going on at the end of projects just because I love just doing OT and, and making a bunch of money and, and getting, you know, all the decisions at that point cannot be messed around with for months and months and months on end. But at the same time, I, I love being at the start of a project too, um, because you have that creative input. I just hate being stuck in the limbo where it's like, oh, we got a year to deliver. So let's just, you know, uh, extend every deadline and, and just kind of continue to play without really having any direction because we don't need it yet. And for you though, like at the very beginning, um, what was it like having that, uh, I would assume more creative say and more input on a lot of the creatures and a lot of what's going on. Like, what was that like? Um, it was, it was, it probably spoiled me for every job after <laughs> because I keep trying to, to gear, you know, uh, any project that comes in, I, I always try to gear them towards blue sky. Like, let us, let us come up with something original and new, um, before you start coming in with like a prejudgment of what you think you want or, you know, what, you know, like, the worst thing is, is like you can bring in images and references from a different franchise and be like, get something like this. And it's like, you're or Disney and you're bringing Warner Brothers. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And it's like, or you can let us, you know, you know, think about something new for you, you know, like tell us, tell us your passion, like tell us why you want something like this or, or, you know, what's the goal of this character? You know what I mean? Like getting really in depth with the design and giving us time to develop something is something that the film industry is is kind of against at this moment. Yes, now I think uh, that I think that there's two people that are doing it right, um, and I think that you know like Marvel Studios is doing it right, and I think that um, uh, James Cameron's team for Avatar is kind of doing it right. You know what I mean? Like they're just I don't know they they're creative thinkers and they're given the time to think and develop. Um, and a lot of film projects that I get on right now, and um, you know, it, it seems like they're just shotgunning it. They're not even giving the the descriptions to the artists. You know what I mean? It's just kind of like a rough ideation, and it's like, okay, we'll just just make an owl guy, and it's like, okay, well, I need more than that. Like, tell me, tell me more. You know? <laughs> yep. Yeah. I actually just got given um, a piece of art a couple weeks back, and it's like 300 by 300 or something like ridiculously small. And it's like, go recreate that. And it's actually like a big environment. And it's like, go recreate that, but make it photo real. And it's like, I can't even see what I'm looking at. Can you give me something better? But I mean, that's just it. Like, um, I feel like that's a metaphor for um, a lot of the input you get on on bigger projects. It's just like, you know, let's let's be as vague <laughs> as we can be, but then I'll um, I'll be you know as picky as I can be as it starts to kind of uh, surface, I guess. But yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of interesting. You're right. Like, it's also when you find the right people that you enjoy working with that you have that really um, kind of fluent communication back and forth. 
because there's some people that there's some directors that I've worked with that I need like a translator just because there'll be three people in the room and for whatever reason I cannot understand anything they're saying but someone else does but then you get those people that you just mesh really well and when you find those people that you you almost all know each other like what each other wants before um, a word goes out of your mouth and those are the sorts of people that you want to work with over and over and over absolutely absolutely it's cool and just talking about a few of your projects because again like you've done uh, a lot of really awesome stuff so um let's say in regards to like league of legends like what were the contributions you had for that um league of legends contacted me to do some uh some ideation or variations to make some of their characters a little bit more photo real for certain tournament things and marketing things uh that was always pretty fun um i got to do my my versions of like uh, I think one of the characters' names is Zed, and then there's an insect guy that I can I can't pronounce his name very well, um, but I got to do really cool pieces like that, and uh, it was always a pleasure working with um, with Riot on that stuff. Yeah, but it's definitely a lot more stylized than I'm used to. Um, yeah, and they're very protective about um, yeah, oh yeah, their style for sure. But it was it was a lot of fun, you know. Uh, and I have a lot of uh, good friends that work over there, and uh, it's always fun to go over there and see what they're doing and how they're creating and, and essentially just seeing all the magic that they get to work with every day. It's kind of neat. That's cool. And was that on site? Mm-hmm. Cool. Did they make you have to get a high score for that one? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had a tour of their studio a few years back and um, yeah, like we were chatting about some of the, the big things that they're doing and um, yeah, that was like the one thing though. They're like, look, you know, HR is really serious about this, so you're going to need to get a certain score. And I'm like, I'll just get my fiance to do it because, yeah, she used to play that game. I'm like, she'll get the high score. <laughs> I'll just give her my account login. Um, <laughs> but that's cool. And, yeah, because I, yeah, I used to work a lot with Blur, who um, has done a lot of their games for Max as well. And there's a few other companies that have. And, yeah, I mean, again, um, it's kind of like with Blizzard, you know, you've got a really massive IP that you've got this huge fan base. And, you know, I, I think that, even just doing slight variations, like let's try and make a, a, a permutation that's more like photo real. Um, I'm, I'm sure that's, for some people there, it's always going to be a bit uh, nerve wracking just because um, you never know, what, especially game fans, like what their reaction is going to be to anything. So, um, you know, yeah, I mean, f for you, I do know what uh, a lot of people's reactions were to you taking more of a stylized kind of ink paint almost uh character and taking it through to more of a photorealistic uh variation you know i honestly don't even know if it was ever released right Go yeah i do i don't know um i've seen i've shown it to a couple people and they they've seemed like they enjoyed it you know what i mean they they liked my versions of it but um i never got clearance to actually show or share those so that's one of those things where I, i'm still trying to to find out what they use the the stuff for and they they do that quite often where they just yeah. do a huge run of artists just to see what we come up with and then they they might either get inspired to do an expansion pack or or new costume sets or something like that or take it in a different way so it's always kind of neat that's cool and what about the, the division um the division um we did a little bit of concept work and uh mostly we were lucky enough to do um a lot of uh marketing uh animatics that we where we took some concept art from them and made it uh fully animated with you know and uh cloth effects and and animating like the like like what is that the tarp on the side of the buildings for the artwork and stuff like that mm -hmm. so we did a lot of that in the the early days before it was launched so like when you would go to e3 um it, it would be like our animated paintings that you would see up on the screen right it's not the uh, the hokey instagram uh animated paintings where they got some like weird distortion on things and i'm not sure if you've seen <laughs> no, that no, or not no. yeah <laughs> no, I, no i love no. that though um because <laughs> yeah i mean I, I love when you can kind of get like a still moment and kind of give it some life um which is kind of cool actually it's kind of funny you worked on Halo and League of Legends, sorry, Halo and Division. Um, like, yeah, I worked on the first trailer for the Division uh, that came out, like, 2014, I think. Oh, um, right. Yes, yeah, so that was a lot of fun. And I got to ask about Halo 2. I mean, uh, what about that project? Was it kind of similar or? Um, that was, we, we got to try to, to um, redesign Cortana, and that was for Axis Animation. And that was really, really fun. It was super scary to touch that high profile of a character because you're like i you know like there's so many different cool ways you can take that character but then also like that's not what they're looking for like they just want 
like subtle changes or subtle differences. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. and that was, uh, that was an interesting job. It was, it was really quick. We were only on it for like, I think three four, to four weeks, but, um, it was an interesting, interesting, uh, a job myself. And, uh, I believe Xander Smith got to do a little bit of work on that. Yeah, no, that's really cool. And you're right. Like it's, it's one of those things that, like I said before, you know, you've got uh, an IP or a specific, very well-known, um, brand or identity that yeah you you can't deviate too much from what people are used to because especially gamers i find are um, very particular about like change you know and um yeah so you got to kind of stick with what's already been pre-established um and yeah i mean i I think it's pretty cool so like with ironclad studios is that uh did you originally from the get-go decide to launch that as a company or uh when did that come around so Ironclad Studios happened right after Goosebumps. I think I took a, like a month off of work um, because we were, I think we worked on it for like almost three, three to four months. We did a lot of designs. Um, so working for Sony Images or Imageworks and uh, working under Rob Letterman with Neville and Carlos, that was, that was a pretty interesting experience for me. And I really fell in love with the idea of not being a lone freelancer anymore. Right. Because mm-hmm. I, I wanted that camaraderie, you know, like I felt like that I wasn't growing as an artist because I wasn't being challenged visually by my teammates or, you know what I mean? Like that kind of that kind of ideology. And um, I was like, well, how do I make how do I start a studio with one under, you know, 50K? And how do I get this to work without a bank loan? Right. Right. So I was just I was literally just thinking about like how how you could do it in a sense where uh, it was almost like a barber shop or hair you know what I mean like or a hair salon. So they I know come it in, sounds do the silly work and, and walk out. Well, it's it's more like you know everybody pays desk rent and then you can do whatever you want. Like if you if you have a job and 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 Ironclad doesn't get, hasn't given you a job, you can still do your freelance from the studio. It doesn't matter. You know, like we weren't looking to make a cut off of what you were doing freelance on your own the jobs that you were getting but the neat part was is that i realized that once i had i had offered that out there to the community and we we kind of had a full office for a very very long time where people were coming in and out and uh you know uh we even had ian mckaig in the the studio for a little bit which was super great um stephen platt really really great artist and uh i realized that i could start pitching ironclad studios as uh you know as a group of people for bigger jobs. And after we started marketing ourselves like that, we kind of stopped, um, we kind of stopped doing things, uh, like the barbershop, you know what I mean? Like people weren't paying for, for the desks anymore. We were just having them come in and just do the work. That's cool. Yeah. Um, I guess like, what was the experience like? Um, again, like you, you essentially create like an incubator for VFX artists, um, to be able to come in and, you know, uh, have a home rather than you're right. Like, I, I think that that's, I work a lot from my home office and yeah, I mean, it's, it's the loneliest thing in the world when you're, um, you don't have those other people to bounce ideas around. You don't get inspired by, you know, just looking over your shoulder and seeing someone doing amazing work. Um, so what was it like kind of essentially creating this uh, creative environment for everyone to kind of thrive in? Well, I think it's a, it's a big uphill battle because we're dealing with things where, I mean, we're, we're getting work in, but we're not getting an, uh, you know, uh, the kind of work that we want in on a regular basis. So it's kind of, it's kind of in a neat way forced us to start doing other things that we're, that we're out of our comfort zone. Um, You know, uh, when we first started, we just wanted to do visual development for film and and TV and games. Mm -hmm. And uh, we started doing a lot of that. And then I think randomly we got a few matte painting jobs in and we really took to that. We were like, oh, cool. You know, and then we saw, saw our work in, in, in shows and stuff like that. And that was kind of neat. Uh, and then we got some kind of random jobs in VR where we got to work and do um, from scratch this, this Batman animated feature, which was really neat. Uh, but we get to do that all in VR uh, while working with Otoy. And then like ever since we... We did that job. We, we've done several others and mobile games. You know, we've worked with Spill Games on uh, Valerian. And uh, it's really neat because we're taking the company into uh, not just a visual development company, but uh, this year we're, we're definitely rebranding ourselves to to be an asset house where it's, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, an art, art, an art outsourcing center is essentially what we're, we're going for. 
That's cool. And yeah, that's what I was going to say. Like, um, you know, do you think that along the way, just by doing all these different things, after all, you kind of organically start to niche yourself into like, oh, shit, when when did we become, let's say, an art outsourcing studio or however it is? Because I, I always find that like the more you are trying and doing different things after a while, it's like, wait a minute, like all we get is these sorts of jobs now. And we've kind of like, a, you know, established ourselves as this is our name and this is what we do now. So, um, yeah, I mean, for you, was that a pretty natural progression just to kind of fall more into that? that category of like now you know this is the type of work we do and all the studios keep coming back for us to um you know create a lot of let's say their assets things like that um yeah i mean it the 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 strange part is is like especially when it comes to film is that it's you know we get a lot of pitch work and then a lot of the the projects don't go anywhere so it kind of hurts us in in that regard where we can't show you know, stuff that we slaved over for six months. And then, you know, we find out the film is, isn't going anywhere <clears throat> and that we can't release the artwork. You know what I mean? So, yeah. you know, to, to kind of com- combat that, you know, we took a look at the, the mobile games world and uh, you know, now, now we're getting into that as well. So I think that it, it's, it's kind of a, it's kind of a mixed bag because it, it seems like it's a small industry once you're in it. And it's hard to keep it, it's hard to keep the same clients coming in because the same clients only have one project a year to come back to you with. Right. Um, so I think that it's it's more about for us was the learning curve of how do we make sure that we have enough work all year round to sustain ourselves. And I think that that's why we have, you know, we, we've taken a look at the mobile games market. And we've we've done a few things in it, and we enjoyed our time in it. But it wasn't our projects, and it wasn't uh, it wasn't us developing it. And that's that's the new section in, in which we are going down, um, as well as as keeping true to doing art outsourcing this year is doing a lot of the mobile games development stuff in house, where we're going to be releasing our own our own games and stuff like that, which is really really exciting um, for me because I've been working on a on a few IP ideas uh, over the last three years. And uh, it's just neat to, to, to talk to the team and be like, yeah, you know, I have this ready to go. Why don't we work on two or three games and then try and do these? Um, and everyone, you know, the resounding office is like, yes, let's do it. And I'm like, okay, well, that's a lot of pressure. Crap. <laughs> <laughs> but I got to do it now. So. It's out there now. You're accountable. Yeah. Cool. Um, and I just got to ask about these three because um, they sound awesome. But like, what did you, um, what were your contributions to Iron Man 3? And what were some of the challenges on that? Um, Iron Man 3, uh, I worked with uh, Ash Thorpe uh, on a... That anti- hack. <laughs> that, I know that hack. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but okay. no, uh, we worked on some end title credit designs and some ideations. And I, I did a few paintings. Um, I didn't really do any design work. The design work was already done by the excellent team at Marvel. But mm-hmm. uh, it was really, really fun to get an opportunity to... to to paint up an, an Iron Man image and then discuss it in house at uh, I think that was for Imaginary Forces, but we we ended up not getting the job. But um, I really loved Ash's pitch. That was a really f- a fun, cool looking end title credit sequence. Uh, I did I did one or two sequences myself and then uh, like a big painting for it. But uh, that was really fun. I really, really enjoyed doing that. There's that's something really about cool. painting the Marvel characters that's just always a blast. <laughs> yeah, it makes you go back to being a kid again. Oh, absolutely. That's cool. Yeah, I've had Ash on the podcast a few times. Um, yeah, that guy's insane. He definitely, definitely works himself to not to death, but yeah, to um, to something. He's he's hardcore. I, um, I don't know how he does it. I I, I generally <laughs> do not understand how he does it. I think it's a lack of sleep. I think he he's <laughs> he's well balanced in terms of having family, in terms of personal life and work. But I think that yeah, the sleep part is probably where um, that bit probably gets ignored a little bit. <laughs> so what about Wolverine again? Because you know these are some like, really amazing IPs that I think everyone gets excited about um, if they had the opportunity to be on it. So like for you, what were some of the big challenges on that project? Um, for that one, we did. Um, I'm trying to remember the characters in that. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I was uh, I was on that one to do uh, Viper designs. Mm-hmm. So we worked on her and, and the design of how she would, you know, what she would look like if she was mad. So, like, could you see Venom coursing through her face and stuff like that? And how would you affect her eyes? It was a lot of, um, uh, like, either CG face alteration or 
you know, practical makeup changes, little subtle things that you could do to make her look like, you know, there was something underneath her skin. And that was a lot of fun. Um, we got to do that for, for quite a while. I think we did like maybe five or six iterations on that before they chose something. But um, I was, I remember that one because I was really bummed. I was really hoping to move on to uh, uh, the silver samurai, but I didn't get a chance to, to do anything for the silver samurai. Oh yeah. Yeah, I really wanted that one. I remember being, I remember hearing that we were we were gonna do uh, the next Wolverine, and I and I was just like, oh man, I really want to try and do you know uh, a take on on the the Silver Samurai because that mm-hmm. would be just so fun to do. Hell yeah, that's cool. You seen the latest one, obviously, Logan. Yeah, yeah. Oh my god, absolutely amazing, <laughs> absolutely amazing. I just got so mad because like the whole time I'm watching it, it just made me think like, why did the other two have to? <laughs> turn out the way they did yeah you know? but uh but yeah that's really cool and yeah i mean for you you know um also you've been doing a lot of training as well and like what's your experience been with like doing that stuff i mean do you find it really fun getting to both um share a lot of the techniques and the things you've been developing and you know what's it been like to interact with your students um it's it's been a blast and i didn't think that I would have I would have enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, I've gotten to teach at places like um, like Red Engine. I've gotten to speak uh, at at places like Trojan Horse was a unicorn um, and IFCC and all these other places. Um, I get to teach for schoolism online. Um, I've even I've even taught a course at uh, at Brainstorm and at Arts and at Art Center, which was really really cool. fun. Um, it's one of those things where. I never knew that I would really like it, but I ended up absolutely loving it. And the nice thing is for us as instructors, I feel like it just, it reaffirms what you already know. And it just makes you, it mm-hmm. makes you really need to, to know your stuff because you're, you're passing on that information. And the worst thing you could do is, is give out false information. So I try to be as real as possible with my students and give them, um, I think the advice that they need to hear. Mm-hmm. No, that's good. Which is nice, yeah. It's really cool. And yeah, you're absolutely right about that. I think that um, in a way, um, having to teach and kind of regurgitate that information, it, it helps you solidify it more in your brain because I think intuitively there's a lot of things that we do that we just do because we, we know it's right. But when you actually need to communicate that to others, whether it's supervising or whether it's training, um, that's when you need to actually kind of more consolidate it and organize things in your brain. Or I should say compartmentalize in your brain so that way um it it does make sense to everyone else but because of that it it also benefits you as well absolutely and um finally just a couple other things but like again just talking about students and other people who you know want to learn and and benefit from this like um do you have any advice for artists i guess on you know how to stand out because again like i think it's one of the things especially in let's say concept and uh, map painting, a few other different categories, especially that there are a lot of people, there's a lot of noise out there and for them to be able to go into the industry and actually get their, um, their big, you know, big chance, I guess, to, um, to make it, it's, um, it's pretty competitive. So, I mean, for you, you know, if you were to give any advice to people about how to kind of get their name out there or stand out or, or get noticed, like, what would that be? You know, it, it's, it's a hard world to, to, to give, um, good advice in that regard, because there's many ways you can go about doing it, but you can also pigeonhole yourself, uh, if you're not careful, you know what I mean? Like, um, I see a lot of, you know, artists that are really, really good at fan art, but can't, can't design something on their own to save their life. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that they, they get in, they get trapped into the, the, the like machine where it's like, <clears throat> you know, they're posting things on Facebooks and they're and they're getting thousands of likes or 300, 400 likes, but they're they're just copying something else that's already been done. Um, and it's, it's 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 I think that that comes down also to a strange issue in in the artist community now, where people don't know the difference between an illustrator and a concept artist, right? Or illustrators mm-hmm. are calling themselves concept artists, or vice versa. You know what I mean? Um, <clears throat> And, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things where you have to look at the industry and know that if there's, if there's nothing but like last of us art, you know, fan art going on, (laughs) do something different because you're just going to blend in, Mm -hmm. you know, or wait, wait to do it later or do it before the game comes out or, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's a tough call. Um, I want to say that 
I personally, I like to see more original stuff get get done. You know, like um, I love seeing Alex Constad's work. Uh, every every new piece he does is something new and exciting that you haven't seen before. Um, and I think he's got a couple of IPs in the work. Watching, uh, you know, Dan Levisi, um, you know, those guys that are out there that are trying to create new IP. Those are the ones that excite me more than you know this week's uh, you know Batman fan art. Sure. I, I like. Don't get me wrong. I love the Batman fan art, but like if if I'm looking to hire someone, I want to see something that can somebody that can rise to the the occasion and actually do design work. Yeah, and actually create rather than uh, I guess mirror em- emulate. Yeah, yeah create exactly. not emulate. Yeah, that's cool. And um, yeah, I, I guess. Like one of the big things I also think is like discipline is is a really critical thing, and we kind of talked about this a little bit uh, at the beginning of the call. But like, um, I think that a lot of people when they first get into the industry, they don't realize like how much work it is. And um, the most common thing I get from people is, you know, I wish I had more time. And for you, I mean, how do you manage all the things that you do? And do you have any advice for people who want to be more productive, or advice for them to be more focused and disciplined? Um, you know, I'm still learning that myself, you know, I'm still learning how to use my time better. Um, I feel like in the last year I've fallen into a rut or a hole of, of management and less art creation. And I feel like I, like, uh, that's not what I got into. You know what I mean? This isn't why I got into this. So it's been, it's been a rough year for me creatively because I haven't really had the time to experiment or to learn new things or to just make weird stuff and get that out of your system. You know what I mean? Like just make it, but you know, I I'm, I'm trying to make changes this year, um, to, to, to correct that. Right. So I'm, I'm trying to go to bed earlier, get up earlier, stay focused longer, uh, get in, get out and do the things that I have to do, automate what I can. Um, or, you know, what can you automate? I'm just curious. Say what? So what typically are you looking to automate? Um, you know, it, I'm, I'm looking to automate a little bit of the inner office, you know, meetings and uh, I guess collaboration times where it's like, let you know, I can't I can't have like a two hour meeting every day um, when one meeting a, a week could do just fine as long as we were focused and on task. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So that's that's what I, I'm trying to get into where, you know, like we, we've had a, almost every kind of job under the sun come through the doors at Ironclad Studios. And I just kind of want to make it a little bit more, at least the back of the house stuff, the office stuff, a little bit more procedured. Mm-hmm. And cool. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make sure that all of that gets done. And so, yeah, it's 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 interesting because I've I've never owned a studio. I've never ran a studio before uh, before now. And but I've been doing that for the last four years with Ironclad and uh, everything's a lesson. Everything's mm-hmm. a lesson. Yeah, that's absolutely. for sure. That's great, man. And finally, I guess, like where where can people go online to find you if they want to check out your work or reach out to you? Um, I'm on ArtStation. You can look me up by Justin Gobi Fields, um, or you can go to justinfields.com, or you can check out all of the work that we've done over the last couple of years at Ironclad Studios, and that's uh, uh, Ironclad Studios with a K. Uh, dot com. Yeah. Great, man. Awesome. Well, thanks again for taking the time to do this. I think this has been awesome. Thanks for having me, man. It was great. All right. So I hope you enjoyed that episode. Again, thanks to Justin for taking time out to chat. I had a blast with this one. And um, again, if you want to check out the show notes, go to alanmckay.com slash 118 for episode 118. And uh, we have a lot of really great uh, information, links to everything, as well as quotes and other key insights all from this episode. The show notes are really lengthy, so it's really cool. And um, lastly, if you want to check out the live action training, it's available till January 12th. Um, check it out now while you can. It's free, so sign up at alamckay.com slash decay, so D-E-C-A-Y. If you want to do me a huge, huge favor and um, it would make my Christmas, it would be uh, just to share it around. If you want to just uh, click the share button and um, uh, once you sign up for it and, and share this on your Facebook or your Twitter or just with your buddies you're sitting next to, whatever. But I would love for everyone to be able to make the most of this training and get a lot from it. And this is a chance for you to really level up your skills for next year, as well as have a finished visual effects shot um, that you can put on your reel and showcase what you can do. So 
I think this is going to be really beneficial. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this episode. I will be back with episode 119 talking about doing a self audit. In other words, really uh, self evaluating yourself in terms of figuring out a lot of your strengths and weaknesses within this year and just where you really excelled and where you can put more time into. Um, this, I think, is a really important one just because we really dive deep into uh, reflecting a little bit differently to what you might be used to on what worked and really kind of getting into the data of it. So I think this is going to be really cool. And I'll be back with uh, episode 121. That's going to be with Sergio Paez, who's a director at Lucasfilm. And we get into a lot of other really awesome stuff too. Uh, lots of cool episodes coming up. So um, that being said, I will leave it here. Check out the show notes, alamckay.com slash 118, alamckay.com slash decay for the free training. And that's it for now. Rock on. Rock on.